Caroline. You are in terrible danger. You probably think this world is a dream come true. This is what happened to 13-year-old Rachel Mellon Skemp. Rachel was born on Tuesday, October 13, 1982 in Melrose Park, Illinois. When she was three years old, her parents Jeff and Amy divorced and Jeff moved to Dallas, Texas while Amy stayed in Illinois with Rachel. After the divorce, Amy began dating a man named Vincent Mellon. They eventually got married and had two children together and moved into this house in Bolingbrook, Illinois. Now, Rachel is described as being a bubbly person with a great sense of humor. She always managed to stay positive, she was the life of the party, and always was the most beautiful girl in the room. She was an honor student, she was into recycling and nature, her favorite subject at school was science, and she eventually wanted to become a school teacher. On Tuesday, January 30th, 1996, 13-year-old Rachel was at school having a pretty normal day. However, as the day went on, her friends noticed that she was crying by her locker, which they thought was odd because she was always cheerful and very happy. So they approached Rachel, they asked her what was wrong, and she said that she had a problem, but that she would take care of it. She didn't really elaborate, she didn't tell them what problem she had, that's all she said. The following morning on Wednesday, January 31st, Rachel decided to stay home from school because she had a sore throat and she felt sick. Mother Amy went to work early that morning and left Rachel in the hands of her stepfather Vincent, who was unemployed at the time so he was able to stay home all day and watch Rachel. At 10.45 in the morning, Rachel called her paternal grandmother Lucy and thanked her for the Christmas presents she had sent. This was a quick 4-5 to five minute phone call and Lucy says that nothing seemed out of the ordinary until Rachel got suddenly quiet. So she asked Rachel, is he there? Referring to Vincent and Rachel said yes before telling her that she needed to hang up the phone. After her phone call with her grandmother, Vincent says that the two of them played Nintendo before Rachel decided to go upstairs and take a nap in her bed. This is when Vincent decided he was going to take the family dog for a walk. Now it was freezing outside, it was 20 degrees below zero, so it wasn't ideal weather for someone to be outside and walking their dog. But that's what Vincent decided he wanted to do. He left the house at around 2.30 p.m. but didn't come back home until 30 minutes later at 3 p.m. He says the reason he took so long is because the dog actually broke free from its collar to go chase a rabbit. He tried to get the dog back on the leash but he wasn't able to so he left the dog and just figured that the dog would eventually make its way back home. At 3.15, his youngest daughter Ashley comes home and immediately goes to Rachel's bedroom to greet her. However, when she walks into her sister's room, she realizes that Rachel is gone. She goes to tell her dad Vincent, but apparently he doesn't do anything about it. And an hour after that, the dog was eventually returned home with the help of a neighbor, and then 30 minutes later, Amy finally arrived home. When Amy arrived home, her youngest daughter Ashley told her that Rachel was missing. This is when Amy began to call all of Rachel's friends, asking if anyone had seen her, but no one had. That's when she decided to call 911 and report her daughter as missing. Vincent says that the last time he saw Rachel, she was taking a nap in her bedroom and was wrapped in a blue blanket. She was wearing yellow sweatpants, a pink top, and red house slippers. Okay, part two is up now. This is part two on what happened to 13-year-old Rachel Mellon Skemp. When police searched her room, two pillows on her bed and the blue blanket that she was wrapped in were missing. However, all of her winter clothes, her shoes, and her coats were still there, along with her purse and her Walkman. There was also no sign of chaos in her room. It didn't seem as if there was any type of struggle or forced entry. Vincent says that when he went on a walk, he did leave the front door unlocked, so that's probably how someone got in. Now, at first, police were not too eager to get on the case because they thought that Rachel had just ran away. This is because a year earlier in 1995, Rachel had actually ran away from home. She had left a note explaining that she was running away because she feared she would be blamed for something that her siblings did. So she ran away to a friend's house and she was gone for almost 12 hours before she called her grandparents and asked them to pick her up. So because of this incident, police believed that she was running away again. They also thought that maybe she had run away to Dallas to go live with her father, Jeff, because she had told him that she wanted to live with him. But after they confirmed that she was not living with Jeff or with any relatives, then they began to think that she may have been abducted. 
As police were investigating, they noticed that Vincent had scratches on his arms. So they asked him about these scratches and he said that he got them by working on his car. Now, police were already suspicious of Vincent, especially after they searched Rachel's bedroom and ended up finding her diary. In the diary, they found an entry from August of 1995 where Rachel says that Vincent kissed her and touched her inappropriately. He told her that he was doing this to teach her a lesson, to show her what a predator is, and to teach her how this shouldn't be done until she's older. Along with a journal entry, they also found a book called Daddy's Kiss. Now, some reports say that the book is innocent, it's just a book about a father and daughter relationship. Other reports say that this book talks about incest. So I'm not really sure about that, but along with the diary and the book, police also found a steak knife underneath Rachel's bed. So now he was abusing Rachel, he was the last person to see her, he had scratches on his arms, and on top of that, he had a history of domestic violence. In 1990, when Rachel was only 8 years old, Amy and Vincent got into a physical fight. He hit her, he pushed her down the stairs, and he verbally threatened her and Rachel. She ended up filing a restraining order against him and a police report, but eventually dropped all those charges and got back together with Vincent. So there's just a lot of information stacked up against Vincent. They also did a lie detector test on Amy and Vincent, and Amy passed hers, but Vincent failed his. They also took a DNA sample from him. They took a semen sample, saliva, and hair sample, but they haven't really revealed any information about that. To this day, in August of 2022, Rachel has still not been found, and no one has ever been charged in her disappearance. Vincent and Amy moved to Tennessee and are no longer cooperating with the Bolingbrook police. They also might have changed their phone numbers or have disconnected their phone because they're not answering anyone's calls. Rachel's real father, Jeff, moved from Dallas, Texas, all the way to Bolingbrook, Illinois, to search for his daughter. If you know anything about Rachel's disappearance, please contact the number on the screen and let's bring her home. Jean Benet Ramsey's case could be finally solved after all these years. CC Moore, who is a cold case DNA expert, has said recently that if she could get her hands on the DNA from this case from the Boulder Police Department, she would be able to solve this case using genealogy. The company CC works for Parabon has actually had a hand already in solving this cold case from Pennsylvania that involved 19 year old Lindy Sue Beekler. Lindy was killed in 1975, and using the DNA from this case, they were able to solve who actually killed her all these years later. All Parabon is waiting on right now is getting access to the DNA in this case, and they have to get access from the Boulder Police Department, or they can't do anything with it. Cece said depending on who the DNA belongs to, the case could be solved in a matter of hours, but it could take years. But the Boulder Police Department has to provide the evidence. This is what happened to 23-year-old Dane Elkins. Dane attended the University of Santa Cruz and studied engineering. Besides being great in school, he also excelled in sports. He's a 23-time world champion racquetball player and was featured in the Los Angeles Times for his achievements. Dane's family describe him as a kind, sweet, and caring person. His siblings say that he is genuinely a good guy and an amazing big brother. His younger brother Cody says that he looks up to Dane and that he has a big heart. On Monday, December 21st, 2020, Dane called his family as he was driving and told them he wasn't feeling well. He had been driving up and down the state of California, most likely distressed and paranoid due to the pandemic. The pandemic had really affected his mental health and he believed that the government was watching him. So he called his family letting them know he wasn't feeling well and unfortunately, that's the last communication they have ever received from Dane. Later that same day at around 8 p.m., Dane's car was found abandoned in a mountainous area between Los Angeles and Bakersfield, California. His car had a flat tire and inside the vehicle was Dane's phone and his wallet. Since then, several people have reported seeing Dane in Northern California. One report is from a woman named Kelly who says she's confident she interacted with Dane outside of a Taco Bell in Oakdale, California in July of 2021. She says that he was a younger gentleman, probably in his early 20s, and that he was nice looking but a little scruffy. It seemed as if he had been traveling on the road for a while. So she bought him a meal at Taco Bell, and she says that he was very polite, well-spoken, and thanked her for the meal. Then she went on her way, and that was the last time she saw this man. A few weeks later, Kelly came across a TikTok urging people to be on the lookout for Dane Elkins, and that's when she connected the dots and realized it was him. Now, there have been a few other sightings of Dane in Oakdale, California. He was using his name at the time and told people he needed money for his journey to Oregon. He has also been seen in Modesto, California with a girl named Aubrey who has been helping him with his journey but the family isn't really too sure who she is. So 
But when the family heard that he was in Modesto, California, they went there to try and find him, but when they got there, he was already gone. Since then, the family has not heard from him or have had any other potential sightings. His mom, Deborah, created a TikTok page called Kindness Mom and has a Facebook group called Searching for Dane Elkins, where she posts updates about Dane's disappearance, potential sightings, and other information. His mom is just wow. She is truly amazing. She has been using social media to help bring awareness on her son's disappearance, and because of this, that's how the potential sightings of Dane have come up. Deborah is calling this search a kindness search for people suffering from mental illness. She says that her son, along with others, need compassion, empathy, and somebody to listen to them. Family says that they know that Dane hasn't done anything wrong and that he's free to be off the grid, but they just want to know that he's safe and that he's healthy. They want to offer him help, and after speaking with several mental health experts, they say that the sooner they find Dane, the better chance of recovery he has. Since there have been sightings of Dane, this gives the family hope that he is still out there. If you see Dane, please tell him that his family loves him and offer him some kindness by giving him food and water. Now let's bring Dane home. I'm sure everybody remembers when Notre Dame caught on fire. But does everybody know what they found buried underneath it? Until very recently, I didn't even know this. There were bodies found under the Notre Dame. In particular, there was this one that's very interesting and weird. It was in a lead sarcophagus in pretty good condition. It's dated back to the 14th century, and this is a very rare burial practice. Obviously, it's in the shape of a human, but what I really want to focus on is the fact that it's made out of lead. So I went ahead and looked up some reasons why someone would be buried in a lead sarcophagus. A lot of the time it was used because it was thought that lead would prevent a spirit from leaving its tomb, so it would be trapped there. The sarcophagus was supposed to be opened in the spring, still waiting to hear who was in there. He turned her corpse into a doll and lived with her for seven years because she was his one true love. This is the story of Carl Tanzler, a German doctor who became hopelessly obsessed with one of his patients. There's not really much we know about Carl's early life other than the fact that after World War I, he lived in Zephyrlis, Florida with his wife and children. Carl was offered a job as a radiology technician in Key West, Florida at the U.S. Marines Hospital. This is where he would assume the name Count Carl von Kossel. Say that three times fast. See, there was something that not a lot of people knew about Carl. Since he was a young boy living in Germany, he had had visions of this beautiful, elegant, dark-haired woman who he was destined to fall in love with. She was his one true love, and he had so many visions of her. And then along comes Elena, the supposed woman from Carl's dreams, and he went bonkers. She had come into the hospital because she had tuberculosis, which was a very, very fatal disease in the early 1900s. Elena was not interested in Carl romantically. I mean, she was half his age. She was 53 at the time, and she had just gone through a horrendous miscarriage and her husband left her shortly after. So she just wanted nothing to do with it, but he kept advancing and advancing and didn't take no for an answer until eventually he said, I can cure you. Carl wasn't a doctor. He didn't know what he was doing, but he tried. Carl stole a lot of x-ray equipment and brought it over to Elena's house, and he made cures for her. But as you might have guessed, it didn't work. She died. Carl, being the lovely human being he is, paid for her funeral and got her this amazing stone mausoleum. But as you might be able to assume, he was up to some weird stuff in this mausoleum. He visited her in the mausoleum for two years, and he was just like obsessed, completely and utterly deranged and obsessed over her. He injected her corpse with formaldehyde, trying to slow down the rotting, like normal corpse process, and said that her spirit and ghost sang to him when he went. But that's not all. Carl decided that he still wanted a life with Elena, so he turned her into a doll. Yeah. He would often dress her up in new clothes that were really fancy and nice and throw parties with her. He had a whole life with this doll for seven years. And of course he did other things. Things that I'm not gonna get into on this platform. But it was actually Elena's sister who discovered him and he was caught and brought to justice.
This is what happened to 16-year-old Monica Carrasco. She was born on December 13, 1986 and was from Balmorea, Texas. In middle school, her nickname was Happy Happy because she always had a smile on her face and brought so much positivity to the room. Her older brother Juan says that she had a very bright future ahead of her. She had a dream. She wanted to do something big. She either wanted to go to Harvard and become a lawyer or she wanted to work at NASA. Monica also loved her faith and was very religious. She was a Christian, a very active member of her church, and often loved to do Bible studies. In 2000, tragedy hit the Carrasco family when her father had a heart attack in front of them. When the paramedics arrived, they tried to do CPR on the dad and it was very traumatizing for Monica and the rest of the family. Unfortunately, he didn't make it and this really impacted Monica because she was very close to her father and she adored him. Monica was dealing with the loss of her father as best as she could, but unfortunately in 2003, she was hospitalized by her mother after losing 50 pounds quickly. She had also developed an eating disorder called anorexia. Her mother was trying to find a treatment center for Monica, but unfortunately, no treatment center would take her since she was under 18 years old. Monica was pretty upset with her mother for having hospitalized her. Since their relationship was rocky, this is when Monica's aunt Velma offered to take her in. She said, well, I'm a stay-at-home mom, Monica can come stay here, and I can watch her and make sure that she eats. And everyone thought this was a good idea. Monica really loved her aunt Velma and her uncle Abel. She said that her aunt was basically a female version of her father. So the plan was set in motion and Monica moved into this house with her aunt, her uncle, and her twin cousins. On Wednesday, October 1st, 2003, Monica called her older brother Juan at around 8 p.m. They were pretty much just catching up, but out of nowhere, Monica started to say some very odd things. She told her brother, why didn't you tell me that I was Jesus? And her brother was like, who told you you were Jesus? And she told him that the little birdies told her. Juan thought this was very strange, so he kept asking her questions, and then she suddenly snapped out of it. Then she asked Juan if she could go live with him in Austin, Texas, but he said no, that she needed to wait until the doctors cleared her. And then they hung up the phone and Monica continued with her night. As the night continued, Aunt Velma and Uncle Abel were getting ready to go to bed, but they quickly checked in on the kids. They saw that the twins and Monica were playing video games, and then they went to bed. Then, at around 11 p.m., Monica stopped playing video games and headed to her room to sleep. However, the twins decided to stay up a little bit longer, but at around 1.30 a.m., they finally decided to go to bed, but they quickly stopped by Monica's bedroom to check in on her. They said they saw Monica in bed, sound asleep. Later that morning on October 2nd, Aunt Velma woke up and went to go wake up Monica. When she went inside Monica's bedroom, she realized that Monica was gone. However, she didn't immediately freak out. She thought that maybe Monica had gone on a morning run or maybe she had gone to the garden outside to pray. However, she realized that Monica's running shoes were inside the room and she also checked the garden and Monica wasn't there. This all occurred at around 7.30 in the morning and it wasn't until two hours later at 9.30 a.m. when Aunt Velma told Monica's mother that her daughter was missing. Police arrived to the scene and they checked Monica's bedroom, but everything seems to be in order. Most of Monica's belongings were there, her shoes, her clothes, her socks, everything. The only things that were missing were Monica's nightgown and her Bible. Okay, part two is up now. This is part two on what happened to 16-year-old Monica Carrasco. The police realized that the only items missing are Monica's pajamas and her Bible. Now, there was a door inside Monica's bedroom that did lead to the outside, and when they checked the door, the door was unlocked. So now police and Monica's aunt and uncle are thinking that maybe she wandered off on her own. However, since her shoes were still there, would she really go barefoot? The terrain around the aunt and uncle's house was pretty rugged. So if she did leave barefoot, it would be pretty painful. Police searched everywhere, but unfortunately there was no sign of Monica. Now Monica's aunt and uncle believe that she may have become disoriented from the medication she was taking and decided to wander off on her own. They believe she left the house, walked all the way to Highway 17, which was only four blocks away, and then hitched a ride from a stranger. There really isn't any evidence to back this theory up, but that's what the aunt and uncle believe. Now, since we're on the topic of the aunt and uncle, I do just want to mention that they were both given polygraph tests and the aunt passed hers, but the uncle failed his. Some people do think it's suspicious that he failed the polygraph test, but again, we don't really know why that happened. There's a lot of reasons why someone could fail. Monica's uncle passed away a few years ago and her mom has come out in 2021 and said that she does not believe the uncle was involved with her daughter's disappearance. Police also investigated a school bus driver that had harassed Monica a few months before her disappearance. She had never officially reported the incident, but it did shake her up enough where she never wanted to ride on the bus again. So police found the bus driver, they questioned him, but they ultimately ruled him out as a suspect. And that's pretty much it, you guys. There aren't really any other leads or suspects in Monica's disappearance. Police do believe that maybe she left on her own, but they also suspect that foul play was involved and that Monica could be in danger. Some people believe maybe the uncle was involved. Other people believe she may have ran away. I mean, we don't really know what happened, but her mother is still searching for her and still has hopes that she will find her. Even if she did wander away because of the medications, she still deserves to be found and her family still deserves to have closure. She was only 16 years old at the time of her disappearance and had a whole life ahead of her. Monica would be in her 30s now. 
There is a website called missingmonica.com where they post updates about the case, information about Monica, where you can submit a tip, and flyers you can download. If you have any information about what could have happened to Monica, please contact the Reeves County Sheriff's Office at this number here. I truly hope more people are aware of Monica's story, and hopefully someone out there knows something that can help the family. Here's a flyer by itself if you guys want to screenshot it and share it on your stories. My thoughts and prayers grow out to the family, and I truly hope Monica is found soon. Murdered and tortured in the woods, stabbed so deep in the back that your spine was severed? This is exactly what happened to the victims of Ivan Milot, a true crime case that will forever haunt Australia. Born on December 27th of 1944, Ivan Milot was part of a family of poor Croatian immigrants. I mean, they literally lived in a shack. His father was very violent and his mom was pretty much constantly pregnant. He had 14 siblings. By the age of 13, Ivan was already a delinquent, so to say. He was really well known by authorities in his area, and he had committed a numerous amount of crimes. It was a pretty bad setup for the family because Ivan and his siblings had very, very intensive weapons training. He knew how to handle a knife and a gun. Even his own brother Boris said that from a very young age, he had psychopathic tendencies. By the age of 26, Ivan was charged with essaying two female backpackers. Unfortunately, the prosecutor's evidence was rather sloppy and he got away scot-free. Perhaps this increased his confidence and this is what made him want to commit or feel like he could commit more heinous crimes. And six years later in 1977, he attempted to SA and murder two other women, but was never charged. At this point in his life, Ivan would boast to his friends that he knew how to make a head on a stake, meaning you could stab someone right through their spine and turn them into a head on a stick. Just normal people stuff, you know. In 1984, Ivan married a woman that was 15 years younger than him. Although when the marriage turned bad, he actually burned down his in-law's house. Totally normal, normal response. Now we're gonna skip ahead to 1989 in Belanglo State Forest in Australia. Between then and 1992, seven backpackers had gone missing in the area. Some of these victims were Caroline Clark and Joanne Walters, Deborah Everest and James Gibson, Gabor Nugenbauer and Anya Hobsheed, Simone Schmidl. Bodies didn't start being discovered until 1992, and the state in which these people died were horrific. It seems as if they were held for a time before they were brutally slaughtered. Some had hands that were bound, others were blindfolded. Mostly they were shot six times in the head or stabbed so brutally and so many times that either they were decapitated or their spines were severed. Gabor was actually decapitated and investigators never found his skull. Part two will be up right away. Ivan Malat was a savage murderer and he was only arrested because of one man. Paul Onions, a former Navy member and probably the bravest person I have ever read about. Years ago while backpacking, Onions had gotten picked up along the highway by a man who introduced himself as Bill. Bill, aka Ivan Malat, was asking some very strange questions like, were you special forces in the Navy? Does anyone know where you're going? Is anyone waiting for you? Does anyone have your location? You know, some real red flag trigger words there. Later, the driver, Ivan, pulled off the road and pulled out a gun and a rope and said, this is a robbery. Paul knew that he either should run or he was gonna die. So he ran as fast as he could and eventually got away. After what I can imagine caused some very serious PTSD in Paul Onions, he agreed to be flown to Sydney by authorities to help in the investigation. Paul was shown 13 pictures of suspects and he picked number four as the person that tried to kill him, Ivan Malott. But the thing that still haunts investigators to this day, even though Malat died of cancer in prison, is that they say that another person was working with him. Some say that it was his sister Shirley, others say it was one of his brothers or just a random person that Ivan knew. With that being said, until his death, Ivan maintained his innocence in prison and some people even think that he didn't commit the murders. What do you guys think? She murdered him, cooked his flesh, and then tried to feed it to his children. This is the story of Catherine Knight, who committed Australia's most gruesome murder. Based on Catherine's childhood and her behavior thereafter, it wasn't a matter of if she was going to commit a murder. 
it was when. We need to go all the way back to the beginning, 1955 to be exact. On October 24th, Catherine Knight was born as a product of an affair in her very conservative town of Tenerfield, Australia. Catherine's father was an abusive alcoholic who essayed her mother on a daily basis. More than that, actually. It was a very, very regular thing in their household. Catherine herself says that she was essayed by multiple family members until she was 11 years old. But in school, Catherine wasn't much better than her father. She actually was a bully and she picked on kids much smaller and younger than her. But she dropped out at the age of 15 because she couldn't seem to learn how to read or write. And then at 16 years old, Catherine got her dream job at a slaughterhouse doing you know what to animals. She actually loved her job so much that she hung her first pair of butcher knives over her bed which would uh, pretty soon come into use. In 1974, she married David Kellett, who, you guessed it, was also an abusive alcoholic like her father. And Catherine's mother even warned David not to marry her because she had a screw loose. On their wedding night, they confirmed their marriage three times in the bedroom, and Catherine wanted to go a fourth time, but David was tired and he fell asleep. She became enraged by this. She was so angry that she tried to kill him. Their marriage lasted 10 years, even though the night of their marriage, she tried to kill him. 10 years. The bar is really low. And oh boy, did their marriage have issues, if you could have guessed. David cheated on night a lot. And one time when she found out about this, she brought her infant, her baby, onto the train tracks right before the train was supposed to come, hoping that the child would get run over by the train. Fortunately, nothing happened. The train didn't come on schedule, so the child survived. Just imagine being in the mindset that Catherine was in and bringing your two-month-old infant to the train tracks to get run over and crushed by a train. You really have to have some personality disorder, trauma, whatever it might be. Anyways, part two up right away. Hey guys, welcome to part three, the least gruesome-ish part of them all. So apparently Catherine just casually had a meat hook sitting in her living room that she hung John Price's body up on. And it's a damn good thing that John warned his co-workers because when he didn't show up for work, they knew exactly what happened. Catherine Knight had killed him just like he feared. So they called the police. They found her hopped up on pills, asleep, next to what remained of John's mutilated corpse. And when they questioned her and woke her up, she was like, oh yeah, well, I don't remember anything that happened last night. Nothing suspicious happened. Really? When police went into the kitchen, they found the lovely sight of John's head boiling in a pot of water with vegetables. Not only that, they found two full plates with, you know, John, both labeled with one of his kids' names on it. And police then realized that she was going to feed his children his, his meat, his flesh, basically, which is ugh, gross. I can't even fathom. I can't even think about just, ah. Catherine Knight was actually the first woman in October of 2001 to be sentenced to life in prison without parole. She will never, ever, ever get out, ever. And this is probably one of the first cases that you guys have seen me cover where the convict didn't get out early or got caught right away. So this is a nice change of pace, I guess. Anyways, comment section now. Let me know what you guys think. Who do you want me to cover next? And let's talk. She murdered her entire family so that she could be with her 300-year-old werewolf boyfriend. And no, this is not the plot of Twilight, so buckle in, trigger warning, this is a wild, wild ride. Jasmine Richardson was 12 years old and could best be described as a happy, giggly, just normal child growing up. She had a younger brother and they lived in Medicine Hat, Alberta, Canada with their parents. That is until she met 24-year-old Jeremy, who would soon be her boyfriend and claimed to be a gothic, 300-year-old werewolf they met at a punk show. Jeremy wore a blood vial around his neck 
He loved the taste of blood and convinced Jasmine to join VampireFreaks.com. Jasmine started to change and her aesthetic got darker and darker and her family definitely noticed it. And when they found out about Jeremy, rightfully so, they grounded her and forbade her from seeing him. I would just like to point out that this is a very clear case of grooming and manipulation. And even though Jasmine still has some responsibility or a lot of responsibility in what is about to happen in this story, I just want to put that clearly out there because Jeremy was 24 years old and she was 12. Mark and Deborah Richardson did not realize that forbidding their daughter from seeing this menace of a human being, this horrendous person, was going to eventually be the death of them. Jasmine was actually the first one to hatch the plan when it came to killing her entire family. And she messaged Jeremy about it on VampireFreaks.com saying that she had a plan and it involved killing her family and living with him, basically running away into his arms. Jeremy took a little bit of pleasure in this, it seems, and his response was that they needed to be more creative with her plan. And so over the next few days, they created a murder plan to kill her entire family, younger brother included. On April 22nd, 2006, Jasmine let Jeremy into her house where he hid in the basement. Deborah heard a loud noise and went to go check it out. Jeremy stabbed her 12 times. Mark came rushing down to the basement after hearing his wife's screams and charged at Jeremy with a screwdriver, but he was no match. He was stabbed 24 times. And when he asked why, Jeremy responded with, this is what your daughter wanted. And at that point, Mark stopped fighting and took his last breath. Upon seeing her dead family when Jeremy beckoned her forward, Jasmine hugged him and whispered something rather seductive into his ear. And this is when they went upstairs to kill her brother. Part two up right away. <laughs> This is one of the creepiest criminal sketches that you will ever see. So the man depicted in this facial composite could be the perpetrator of the Lake Bowden murders. On the 5th of June in 1960, teenagers Malia, Anya and their boyfriend Seppo and Nils went camping together at Lake Bodum in Finland. Three of the teens were found the following morning, unalived in their tent at the campsite. Apart from Nils, who was found almost fatally injured outside of the tent. An investigation began into catching the culprit who had committed these horrendous crimes, but not much came from their efforts, particularly as police had allowed locals and onlookers to trample the crime scene, hoping that more people meant they might be able to actually find something. But in actual fact, they just contaminated all of the evidence. However, there was one bit of evidence. Some witnesses had seen a man with blonde hair walking away from the tent early that morning before the bodies were discovered. And Nils had also seen his attacker. From the description he and the other witnesses gave, this is the sketch they came up with. It's really creepy. But what's even creepier is at the funeral of Malia, Anya and Seppo, this photo of the crowd was taken. If you look closely, you'll see a man who is almost identical looking to the police sketch. Police believe this man in the crowd to be Hans Asman, and I'd say he looks really similar to the sketch as well. He only lived several kilometres from the shore of Lake Bodum and matched the description of the offender perfectly. Another potential suspect was a man named Carl Valdemar Gilstrom, who owned a kiosk near the campsite and was known to be hostile to campers. And the final suspect was Nils himself. Nils was actually arrested for the murders in 2004, but was found not guilty of the crime a year later. To this very day, no one really knows who committed the Lake Bowdoin murders. You guys remember your mama telling you not to play with your little friends because they might have it out for you? That's the story of Skylar Nisi. Skylar Nisi was a sweet, caring, very responsible little girl who was born February 10th, 1996. In second grade, Skylar would meet Sheila Eddy. This she-demon 
little girl and they became super close like going over to each other's houses um spending all their free time together and it seemed like they would have a friendship like family in Skylar's freshman year of high school, the two girls, her and Sheila, would meet Rachel Schof and become a trio. That's never good news. It became pretty apparent in the group that Sheila and Rachel were becoming closer, leaving Skylar out of meeting up and doing things. They were both bad influences on Skylar, and people around Skylar realized this. And warned her, told her, hey, like, you might want to stop hanging out with these people. They they seem jealous of you. They seem like they don't really like you. But, you know, Skylar had been friends with, like, these girls since forever. Especially Sheila since elementary school. So she trusted them with a lot of things, including her life. So one day, Skylar comes back from her job at Wendy's at, like, 10 p.m., kisses her mom, says, I love you, kisses her dad, says I love you, and then heads to her room to retire for the night. Turns out, it'd be the last night they ever saw her. On July 6th, at like 12.30 a.m., Skylar Nisi hops out her window onto a small bench. She's carrying like a bag of stuff, a purse of stuff, and hops into an unknown vehicle and speeds off. She's found missing the next day. Her dad stops by her room midday, sees she's missing, her job calls um, after her shift because she didn't make it to her shift, and her parents immediately call the police. A whole search starts, and the whole neighborhood is helping look for her, Sheila's helping look for her, Rachel's helping look for her, her parents are going door to door asking if anyone has seen her, there are flyers up. This is a serious, serious thing. Everyone loved Skylar. So it turned out in the end that Skylar sneaked out and hopped in the car with Sheila and Rachel, where they proceeded to take her into the woods and stab her to death. They left her out there to bleed and left the weapons there and got back in their cars and went back home. Pretended that they did nothing, helped out with the search, helped comfort the parents, and eventually got caught. Leave any cases that you want me to cover down below, and I'm also going to be covering. She disappeared without a trace, and the only clue left behind was a mysterious note in her bedroom. This is the disappearance of Tabitha Tudor. Tabitha was anything but a problematic child. She had good grades, she had a good relationship with her parents, and two adult siblings that didn't live with her. When she was 13 years old, she disappeared without a trace. It was April 29th, 2003, and her mother Deborah and dad Bo had left for work already. And at some point, after 7 30 a.m. on her 10 minute walk to school, Tabitha vanished. She was last seen getting into an unknown red car with an unknown male driver wearing a baseball cap. Although her parents say that that's impossible, Tabitha never would have gotten into a car with a stranger, which kind of makes you wonder. The only suspicious thing that police found that was out of character or out of place was this note in Tabitha's bedroom TDT NMTH. TDT is Tabitha's initials, so who is MTH? Typically, a girl this age would write her initials on a piece of paper with another person's initials if she had a crush on them or was fantasizing in some sort of way, or if she was leaving behind a hint of someone that might have been stalking her. You never know. But it does seem pretty suspicious considering her parents say that she would never get into the car with someone she didn't know. Was this someone that she was crushing on and possibly was grooming her in some sort of disturbing way? These are all just questions I'm asking myself as I'm researching this case and I figured I'd let you guys know what's going on inside my head as I'm reading up on this. People actually believe that Tabitha is still alive and it is because on October 30th, 2003, a truck driver and a hotel front desk concierge both saw a man with two girls, teenage girls, that looked very, very scared with him. And both people said that one of the teenage girls looked a lot like Tabitha. So FBI and other missing persons resources have come up with this photo of what Tabitha might look like as an adult at 32 years old today. Her parents actually 
fully believe that she's still alive and that she was sold into a sex trade. What do you guys think? Do you think that Tabitha could possibly still be alive? This is Jennifer Daughtery, and she was a victim of probably one of the worst crimes I've ever heard of. This is your trigger warning. This is going to be a rough one. Over the course of two days, these six people, now named the Greensburg Six, tortured and killed Jennifer. These people were her so-called friends. The main reason behind this was because Angela and Penny were jealous because two of the men liked her. They were flirting with Jennifer. They concocted this plan and decided over a vote between the six of them if they were going to kill Jennifer. Before they killed her, they had her write this note so that they could pass it off as suicide. Although Jennifer was 30 years old, she was disabled and her mental capacity was only that of a 14 year old. They cut her head off and put it into a Hello Kitty stuffed animal. You asked and you shall receive. It's time to cover the Hello Kitty murder. In 1999, a 14-year-old girl walked into a Hong Kong police station. She had a rather peculiar story. She said that the ghost of a woman was haunting her and wanted her to go to the police. Of course, at first the police were like, why are you coming to me with a ghost story? We're not the ghost patrol. But the girl soon explained that the ghost that was haunting her was a woman whose murder and torture she was involved in. There is a lot to go over here, so let's get into it first. Trigger warning, if you do not like gory cases, turn this video off. This is not for you. To make any of this make sense, we have to go back to the beginning. Fan Man Yi is our unfortunate victim, and she had a really, really horrible life, to say the least. Her parents abandoned her at a very young age, and she grew up in a series of orphanages and girls' homes. By the time she was a teenager, she was already addicted to drugs, and she got into sex work and prostitution to be able to afford her addiction. At 23 years old, she started working as a hostess at a nightclub. This is where she met 34-year-old Chan Man Locke. As a pimp and drug dealer, he was not the man you wanted to mess with. Some people say that he was in or had connections to the triad. Fan stole from Chan when she was desperate for money in 1997. She took his wallet. In search of a punishment for her, he had two of his henchmen kidnap her and bring her back to an apartment. This is where Fan would endure a month of merciless torture. Any horrible things you can think of, she went through it in this month. One morning, Chan woke up and Fan was dead. Of course, they said, oh, it was a drug overdose. Yeah, that makes sense. No, she 100% succumbed to her injury after a month of what these men did to her. So this horrendous human being over here cut up her body and boiled her flesh to get rid of the rotting meat smell and boiled her head. They cooked her flesh on the same stove that they were cooking their meal and stirred it with the same utensils that they were stirring their meal. Ugh. Ugh. So after all of this was done, they put her skull inside of this Hello Kitty mermaid stuffed animal. Ugh. This one right here. The apartment, weirdly enough, was filled with Hello Kitty memorabilia. Thus, this murder was called the Hello Kitty murder. Part two up right away. Every time he turns around, I kind of get that feeling, no, oh, no, you know, he's going to get me next. You know? But yet, yet you're fascinated by him. Very, very. Every night when I go to bed, I just, you know, I get very scared. I shut my door and lock him. You know? I'm not afraid of him. He just doesn't look like the type to kill somebody. You try to imagine yourself in his place and to see how he's feeling, looking at the pillow, if he really did it or not. 